Welcome to the new digital age. We meet today precisely a half year since a microscopic virus has made a mockery of all our science and technology. We meet amid this reality. The pandemic spans the globe, the death toll rises, and the tools we have to defend ourselves have not changed much since the great plagues of history, lockdowns, distancing, and masks. But there's an interesting Israeli angle here. Within weeks of the outbreak, Israel's innovation machine snapped into action. Hundreds of companies dropped everything, pivoted, accelerated, joined the charge against COVID on all fronts. Israelis know how to go into battle mode, and so it was with COVID. In a classic Israeli mashup, a hospital set up a war room that coordinated a joint effort between the military, startups, large companies, health funds, and government ministries. Yet there's been a lot of misery and hardship, including here in Israel, where we are right in the heat of the second wave. We're all living through a health crisis wrapped in an economic crisis, wrapped in a social crisis. But there may be a silver lining. This pandemic is also serving as a trigger to accelerate the global transition to a new digital age. That is the subject of our three-day conference. Walk with us through the five sessions that we have in store. Well, Startup Nation Central typically introduces a specific innovation sector at a time, Today, we decided to go broader and deeper. We've invited leaders from around the world to engage with our own tech leaders in a discussion around the forces that are shaping what we're calling the new digital equilibrium. In a few minutes, you'll hear from two leading practitioners taking apart what we know about cities and their future. But first, we turn to Tel Aviv's own beloved mayor, Ron Huldai, to offer opening greetings. Dear guests, I wish to thank Startup Nation Central for inviting me to open this conference. And when the pandemic hit Tel Aviv Yafo, we realized that since we are a startup city, we already hold the tools to oversee this crisis and to come up with new strategies. We develop unique COVID-19 dashboard, providing us with all necessary data to manage the city. This later served us as the foundation for our COVID-19 control and command center. We upgraded, upgraded all of the municipalities' existing digital and smartphone platforms, adding new features, such as panic button for elderly, we collaborated with the local ecosystem by hosting an international hack hackathon and held many more online activities with the public and private sectors. And for no less importance, we initiated the platform Digital for Businesses. And soon we shall have New City Bitcoin. During this time, the Tel Aviv Yafo municipality also collaborated with cities and international networks to exchange knowledge and share experiences. And, and of course, also practices. I hope you have an inspiring conference and look forward to welcoming you soon in Tel Aviv Jaffa. And finally, as the Jewish New Year approaches, I wish all of you Shana Tova, Happy New Year, bringing health and happiness and hopefully vaccination soon. Thank you, Mayor Khuldai, for your inspiring words and amen to the vaccine. Before we get started, a word about Startup Nation Central. We're an Israel-based nonprofit tasked with strengthening Israel's innovation sector. We connect Israeli technologies with global leaders to solve their most pressing challenges. How do we do that? Well, data is at the base of all our activities. 
We accumulate data from across the entire tech sector. A few years ago, we launched a platform, Startup Nation Finder, which is a super helpful online and free platform that has become the authoritative mapping of Israel's entire tech ecosystem. Now, we also want to hear from you, our audience from all over the world. And I mean all over the world, literally. I know that we have some 1,200 people that have signed in to join us for, for this uh, conference, whether entrepreneurs, government leaders, corporates, multinationals, investors, and so on. But what's even more interesting is just the sheer range of cities that you've joined us from. I just picked out a few from the, uh, from the uh, panel room, from the control room here. So we have participants from Rio, Beijing, Paris, Madrid, Istanbul, Johannesburg, New York. And I'd like to give a special shout out to those that have joined us from the UAE. It is a real pleasure to have you with us here this afternoon. Now, we also want to hear from you during the course of this conference. At the beginning of each session, we invite you to answer a one question poll that directly relates to the content of that panel. All you have to do on the conference platform is go to the tab that says on it, poll. Okay, and you answer the question, it's a one question, and at the end of each session, I commit to sharing the results. So question number one for the panel that we're about to start is, will cities such as New York, Seattle, or Tel Aviv remain strong innovation hubs? It is my pleasure to turn this over to the CEO of Startup Nation Central and professor of economics and finance at Hebrew University, Professor Eugene Candle. Thank you, Wendy. Hello and welcome, everyone. Epi epidemics tend to affect uh, more densely populated areas, and Corona was no exception. It definitely affected the cities around the world. But our question today is what can we expect in the long term after the pandemic is over? What will be the long lasting effects on our cities? I want to pose one scenario. Suppose that the new normal of remote work, study, and play drive city dwellers to a better quality of life closer to nature, lower prices and larger square footage of their residential uh, real estate. At the same time, businesses may realize that by employing people remotely, they can get access to a much bigger uh, pool of human capital, while at the same time lowering their real estate prices. What that will do is to reduce the demand for residential and commercial real estate in the centers of our large cities. And cities may end up with fewer residents and fewer businesses with, uh, that provide most of the city's income. And so the lower income uh, residents of the cities may be stuck between not being able to leave and not being able to stay because the services will become more expensive. So how likely will it be uh, a, a return to 1970s in New York City where the city sort of declined? But this time, maybe not only the residents will, will leave to the suburbs, but also the large businesses. How likely is it is, a, is a, a really important question. We are privileged to have with us today Professor Edward Glazer from Harvard University, one of the world's most renowned experts in economics of cities. And he has graciously agreed to provide us with his views on the post-COVID development of cities. So Ed, thank you for joining us and virtually welcome to Tel Aviv. Thank you for having me on. It's great to be here. Uh, Ed, let me first ask you about the history of cities and pandemics. I mean, they definitely were shaped by, by pandemics, but they also sort of survived pandemics. What do we learn from the history uh, about today's pandemic? So if you peer into the very distant past, you can certainly see cases in which cities and even whole urban civilizations were devastated by plague. I think there's a good argument that the golden age of Athens ended in 430 BC uh, with the plague that killed Pericles. 
and uh, that possibly at least the Justinian's plague that came to Constantinople in 541 had even more devastating consequences. Uh, that emperor, of course, had his dream of reimposing the Pax Romana on the Mediterranean world, uh, see it be completely shattered by the appearance of Yersinia pestis, the first appearance of the bubonic plague on, uh, in, in, the, in the West, and a uh, good argument that eight centuries of rural poverty followed. But, but since the 14th century, plague pandemic has come and come again. It has, as you say, disproportionately struck cities and cities have overwhelmingly proved resilient, right? They survived the 14th century. In fact, uh, the 15th century that followed was one of the great ages of urban rebirth. Uh, they survived the plagues that came in waves during the 19th century. First yellow fever that struck the cities of, of the east coast of the US and then cholera that emerged out of the Ganges Delta and devastated the, the cities of Europe and, and Asia um, and North America. Um, these plagues were far deadlier than COVID-19 so far has been, and yet cities grew despite them. Um, despite the fact that there was a substantial mortality gap, a boy born in New York City in 1900 could expect to live over six years less than a boy born in rural America. Despite that, cities continued to grow. And one part of cities' resilience was the fact that cities made investments to make themselves healthier. The most important of these were the investments in clean water and sanitation. Cities spent as much on those two uh, vital urban resources in 1900 in the US as the federal government spent on everything except for the post office and the army. But it's also true that other parts of city life that we love and have forgotten have a link to pandemic did in fact come about in response to cholera, like for example, New York's beloved Central Park, which garnered political support precisely because it, that green space was seen as a refuge from, an un, uh, from, from a plague that really wasn't understood. So what, what it teaches us is what doesn't kill us, that makes us stronger, basically. Um, <laughs> it, at so, least oh, since 1350, yes. <laughs> yeah, at least, right. And so hopefully we're in the second scenario so uh, there could be, all, although this doesn't mean that they immediately recovered. Uh, so let's go to sort of more, more recent. And what can you say about the new re remote work normal after the pandemic? Will it be sustainable and to what extent? How will it affect the cities? Will it be a massive first order impact? And what will it do to commercial and, real estate, uh, commercial and residential real estate prices? So um, we have actual data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics about the share of Americans that have uh, switched to remote work. So in May of 2020, 35% of American workers or 49 million workers told the Bureau of Labor Statistics that they were, they were remote commuting because of the pandemic. Uh, that actually didn't even include uh, the number of people who were not working because, you know, who had started remote working before the pandemic. Uh, so probably the, the correct number was more like over 40% had switched to remote work uh, or had gone to remote work. Um, that number declined a bit by July. So by July, uh, only 26% of American workers uh, were, were dialing it in because of the disease. Uh, but that's still 38 million. So these numbers are really huge. Um, what do we think is going to happen after this? Well, we've done these polls uh, my co-authors are, are Mike Luca, Chris Stanton, Zoe Cullen, Alex Bartik, and Marion Bertrand of business leaders, both uh, using the Alignable Network of Small Businesses and the National Association of Business Economists, which uh, polls the business economists typically in larger businesses. We typically find that 35% or more uh, of the businesses predict that 40% or more of the workers who have switched to remote work will stay remote working. So that's really a potentially very big number, right? So uh, you know, even if it's 15 or 20 percent out of uh, 40 uh, million Americans, that's going to be six million or so uh, if that if that number is actually uh, correct. And it could be, in fact, higher. It could be you know 10 million. Now, um, so that's that's potentially a very large shift out and a rise of remote working. Those projections, of course, don't anticipate the way in which the system recalibrates itself. So you cast a vision of you know, empty office space it's in your introductory remarks. But of course, prices react when there's a shock downward in demand. And 
I think there's no doubt that in the short run, there's been a huge negative shock to demand for office space. Many of our office spaces right now are empty. But once the plague is under control, and I'm, I think all of this scenario assumes the plague will be under control, hopefully sometime in 2021, um, that once the plague is under control, the real estate market will start acting normally again. And that means that landlords will be highly incentivized to fill that space. And that means they're going to be cutting rents if demand is, has declined. And so it may not be the same businesses that reoccupy the space. But in much of the, the most successful cities of the world, there were huge complaints about affordability of both residential and commercial space before the pandemic struck. Prices coming down surely isn't the worst thing in the world. And as prices start to come down, new occupants will be found. They probably won't be the same occupants. They may be scrappier uh, startup business instead of old, well-established firms. They may be residential users instead of commercial users. But I think we should bet on the ability of landlords to fill their space, and we should bet on the ability of cities to reinvent themselves. Um, this, is, this is very interesting. Do you have uh, data that would indicate how, what percentage of these, let's say, either 40 million or the expected uh, 10 million in the future, uh, how they distribute it across different city uh, sizes? Uh, do you expect larger cities to, to lose more in percentage terms sort of to, to the remote work because that's where higher paid workers are and they're more likely to work remotely? Uh, that's, that's one question. What can cities do to reverse or slow the exit? What, what, what would you recommend if you were advising them? Um, so those are both great questions. So the answer on data is we do know quite well by industry uh, how these things are breaking down. And we have some other data at the, at the worker level as well. We don't have great data right now as of city size. Um, we know that the switch to remote working has been an overwhelmingly a phenomenon of the educated. Uh, it's been a phenomenon of richer workers. Uh, and once again, you know, like all of the switches to technology that we've experienced over the last 40 years, they tend to have favored the skill. So, you know, Zoom is no different. And even though it is probably true that we lose a fair amount from, you know, at the highest level from, from uh, you know, the inability to interact face to face. After all, right, most of our highest paid workers are some of the most interactive people on the planet, right? The first person I knew in my circle who had COVID was the president of Harvard, right, was my boss. And uh, that's not because he in engages in any sort of regular high-risk activities, but he meets a lot of people. So it doesn't particularly surprise me that he was the one who got struck first. That tells you that um, high, the high end of the income distribution does like face-to-face -face interactions. Their, their you know, product involves uh, meeting lots of people. And so they do lose when they're not able to interact face-to-face. -face. But on the other hand, they're still going to have a job if they're not able to meet face-to-face, -face, which is true of most of the world's knowledge workers. However, at the bottom end of the skill distribution, uh, no, right? Uh, you know, if you think about the, the evolution of employment over the last 200 years, the move from farm to factory to urban service jobs, the ability to provide an iced latte with a smile has been an employment safe haven for workers without engineering degrees from MIT uh, throughout the world. And this safe haven has just disappeared like a puff of smoke in the wave of a pandemic. Because these urban service jobs are incredibly vulnerable to disease, either to getting to the disease, because the, the reason these jobs exist are, are because people are willing to pay a little bit extra for human interaction. And of course, that desire disappears completely when you're faced with a, a threat, of dis threat of illness. So either the jobs disappear or the workers face the threat of getting sick, and both things are going, going on. So we should expect um, the switch to remote working to be stronger among the more skilled in the short run um, and sort of, you know, devastating for, for the less skilled. In the longer run, I suspect many of the most skilled people in the world are going to want to get back into the face-to-face -face contacts that were the norm of their life before the pandemic struck. Um, I can pivot now to what cities uh, cities can try to do to protect themselves, if you want me to, Gene. Is that, or uh, did you want to respond to that? No, no, of course. Okay. Of course, please. So you also asked, um, you also asked what can cities do to try and, and um, protect themselves so and try to reboot themselves. So there are a series of things that problems that cities were facing before the pandemic, and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to get to those later, but they're going to need to address some of those. 
In fact, in some cases, the pandemic has eased at least one of the problems, which is one of the largest traumas that they faced was the affordability crisis. That's just gotten easier. Uh, so, you know, prices are going to be more affordable in the short run. And as nor as prices get more affordable, affordable the, so let's say the gentrification battles will become less severe. So one pre-existing uh, crisis has gotten easier. Um, but there are others like the failure of schools in many of America's most successful cities. Those problems re will remain and got worse because of the difficulty of providing education during this pandemic. That is certainly very big uh, on any urban agenda. Um, specific to the pandemic, though, I think the largest issue is going to be rebooting the small business ecostructure. And uh, that's why the work of, of Startup Nation is so important that, um, you know, successful cities in the 21st century, just like successful cities in the 18th century, need three things. Smart people, small businesses, and connections to the outside world. In the U.S., at least, uh, perhaps not in the tech sector, but in, in many other sectors, uh, the pandemic has been devastating to small businesses. Right. Any small business that specialized in providing face-to-face -face services has been struck terribly by this disease. Very few of them had much of a cash cushion going into this. And uh, our own, again, same, same group of co-authors, our own surveys from uh, the months of April, May, and June suggested that many of them did not expect to be able to survive. Um, now, that's okay. Small businesses fail all the time. To be able to fail and dust yourself off again is uh, part of being an entrepreneur. But at the same time, if the recovery rate is too slow, it's going to be very tough for, for cities. So I think one of the first things that you need to do as a big city mayor in, you, in the U.S. is ask yourself how you can make it easier for small businesses to reboot yourself. Have you made the permitting process as easy as it can be? Have you thought about creating a one-stop permitting office where anyone can come and you know, check off all the boxes that you need to, to, get, to get going again? Um, you know, regulatory red tape, red tape is just too expensive uh, a weight to place on would-be entrepreneurs in the wake of this pandemic, when you need those entrepreneurs to come back and to come back as strong as possible. It's definitely, I strongly, strongly agree with your, with your last point. Uh, I agree with most of your point, but uh, with the last point is definitely, this is something that we've been advocating to the, to the Israeli government to drastically overhaul the regulatory uh, environment so to make it much easier to to employ people and 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 help businesses uh, one thing that you mentioned is about um, about small businesses many of these small businesses are in retail and uh, even before the commerce uh, e-commerce was eroding the main street basically you know in many places eliminating the 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 main street and so now the the additional difficulties that you mentioned that people stopped coming to shops, they, uh, will they be able to survive? Will the retail shop be able to survive? And how will that affect the cities? And whether the cities can do anything about it, whether the cities can, for example, introduce, we've seen something like local currencies, sort of neighborhood currencies we've seen in Tel Aviv uh, that, that support local businesses because, uh, you know, Amazons of the world will not accept that currency whether it's local shared spaces, zoning, uh, local taxation of delivered goods, all kinds of pr uh, proposals that would somehow support the local uh, fabric of, of these small businesses that we were talking about. Any thoughts on that? Sure. So, um, first of all, just to, just to echo your comment earlier, right? Prior to COVID-19, we were already in a period of tremendous flux for ground level retail in cities throughout the world. Um, the rise of e-commerce badly challenged many of these stores. I would have said the process that we're in uh, was essentially a transition from street level commerce that sold goods, which could be replaced by Amazon, to street level commerce that sold experiences that cannot be replaced by Amazon. Now, you know, that still led to vacancies, and uh, but still I was hopeful that, again, this equilibrating process where prices decline till the space gets filled eventually would create enough experienced selling entrepreneurs to occupy the empty spaces. Now, selling experiences, those experiences are inevitably face-to-face -face experiences. Those experiences are also badly shook and shaken by uh, COVID-19. Uh, so it's going to take a while for them to come back as well. Um, and your question is what local policies can do about this. So first of all, you know, as someone who, who comes at many of these things with sort of a, an instinctive 
uh, let's say, fair attitude towards uh, running business and certainly towards local industrial policy. It, it took me a while to sort of figure out, uh, uh, you know, conditions under which I thought that that was OK. And I think I think I came to it from the perspective of what do mall owners do? So mall owners manage pedestrian spaces. They try to attract people to their areas and they frequently engage in what's looked like what looks like local industrial policy, right? They offer lower rental prices for some businesses than others in order to control the mix of what businesses are in their area because they know that their overall mall only is attractive if it offers a, a great mix for, for potential customers who would come down. So to what extent can local governments mimic that? I think in limited ways. Um, I, I would push back on most attempts to sort of engage in protectionism that make it difficult to buy things from elsewhere. But there surely are things in terms of providing the goods that local governments do provide, like parks and, and safety and uh, you know better streets and fun street art. There certainly are things that they can do to support local businesses in a, in a sensible way that don't go all the way towards taxing competitors or whole scale subsidies. Um, and certainly being as open as possible to, uh, you know, providing cheap forms of, of support for, you know, businessmen who are, who are trying to make some form of a, of a place work, that's certainly a reasonable thing to be. So I think it needs to be a light touch, right, uh, especially given the fiscal strains that cities are, are under right now and will be under for many years, but some degree of energy that recognizes that vibrant streets are an important part of making cities work. I think that's a good thing for local governments to do. I, I see. So basically, you're saying like just like the mall owners uh, take care of the negative externalities and create some positive externalities to increase the total traffic. That's the that's in providing some public goods that no individual store will provide. That would uh, that would be sort of similar. Um, malls also struggling. So um, <laughs> yes, they're also struggling. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> but but just but just that's not an excuse for massive taxes and subsidies. That's an no, excuse. No, no, of for course, sure of course, of course. I'm just right. saying. I'm just saying that is right. something that's being proposed. Both of us, when you know, we come from the same school, uh, so this would be hard to to for us to 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 justify. So let let me let me take you to 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 this point that you were saying that this is about selling experiences. And some people actually go much further and talk about a transformation of cities into self-sustaining uh, neighborhoods uh, which have their own places of work, possibly shared spaces, their leisure, their amenities, their businesses. And so most of the time people would not even need to travel outside of these neighborhoods for, unless they need to, to go for something unusual. So that would imply more local businesses that are self-sufficient, more additive manufacturing perhaps, more growing food locally. So how likely are these solutions to succeed and become a permanent fixture of the large cities? We've seen some attempts in, in some cities. And uh, if that happens, will it sort of uh, make the city a non-entity? Will it be enough to keep it as a big cluster? Um. I think this type of scenario seems unlikely as a widespread phenomenon. I mean, there are certainly particular neighborhoods and, and new ones may emerge, which have a very strong sense of neighborhood identity. Sometimes there's a very powerful community organization and they're able to provide community goods that really bind the neighborhood together. And that's absolutely fine. But the basic structure over the past two centuries is that cities of, you know, began two centuries ago when transportation was incredibly costly with a very strong parochial focus, right? You barely left your small little community to connect across the city. And, you know, things that we think of as now being part of the same city were once, you know, quite different. I mean, Brooklyn was a completely different city from Manhattan in 1895. Right? And yet, because of transportation linkages, because of the ease of moving across space, these neighborhood boundaries declined in importance, and the city became one city rather than 20. Um, so COVID has made transportation more difficult. They, it's pushed an emphasis on the local. Many of us have been sheltering in, in place, and our worlds have suddenly become very small. But assuming that, again, the disease disappears by mid-2021, I don't think there's going to be a huge demand for restricting your movement within the city. Uh, I think, in fact, people will be eager to re-explore the spaces that they haven't visited for a while. 
But that being said, there will be some local entrepreneurs who will work to create more neighborhood vibrancy, uh, more neighborhood uh, gardening, more neighborhood public goods. And that's all to the good. But I think it will be more the idea that you have more local options, not that there are barriers that emerge between neighborhoods. I see. This is this is very interesting. So transportation is actually the the linkage that actually makes things flow and makes them more efficient, but it also creates sort of these centers uh, that 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 a lot of people sort of converge to. Uh, if we're already talking about transportation, what would be your predictions regarding the transportation? Are we going to see more or less congestion in the cities and around them? What about shared mobility that's been sort of gaining popularity, um, you know, sort of coming out of pandemic and, and into sort of longer term? So uh, there are a couple of things going on. So one of which is we have fewer people moving right now. And so that has made our congestion problem much less. You also have an absolute terror of public transportation. Um, so, you know, a May poll of Massachusetts residents had about 80% say they were unwilling to take public transportation even when it became legal everywhere to do it. And more than 50% said they were unwilling to take public transportation even when COVID-19 had a treatment. Uh, that number drops to, let's say, 25% if once COVID-19 has a, has a vaccine. But I think there's going to be a lot of anxiety about densely packed subway cars for uh, a lot of uh, years. And that's going to mean that, in fact, you're going to have pressure to drive more. Um, so you have these two competing things, uh, less use of public transportation, more less use of, of travel in general. I think it's going to be hard to guess which one is going to dominate. And so into that mix comes the exciting possibility of new technologies around mobility. Autonomous vehicles are certainly one public transportation options that are safer, minivans with separation between the users, for example, that make people comfortable sharing some degree of, of mobility. All of these things are quite possible. We should be open to, to all of them. Um, the, the thing that's sort of important from a public policy perspective is to get ahead of the game and thinking about how you're going to manage the extra congestion that new forms of mobility create. So the advocates of autonomous vehicles are very big on how the engineering aspects of autonomous vehicles will lead to less congestion, right? So you have more seamless uh, merging, for example. Um, but the first order effect of making it less expensive to sit in traffic because you don't have to pay attention to the road because you can do work, because you can play on your, your phone, you can do whatever you want, right? Um, the first order effect of making it cheap to sit in traffic is that more people will be willing to sit in traffic. And that will lead to more, not less congestion, which means that autonomous vehicles have a tremendous capacity, no matter what their engineering advantages are, they have a tremendous capacity to clog our nation's roads, both on uh, your nation's roads, both on the in intra-city and inter-city uh, routes. The most natural, the most effective way to do this was dreamed up by Bill Vickery in the 1950s. Uh, and it's congestion pricing. There's no reason not to charge drivers for the social cost of their actions, uh, congestion and also pollution. Um, there's no reason why you can't do this in real time uh, with a GPS based transponder of some form that essentially directly charges the drivers of autonomous vehicles for the congestion that they create. And one thing we've learned about congestion pricing politically is that if you put congestion pricing on a new travel route, you can get away with it, right? You open a new highway, it's fine to have a toll. If you try to put a charge on roads that used to be free, then there's blood in the streets, metaphorically. Okay, so you've really got to have congestion pricing on autonomous vehicles from the beginning. Because if they're introduced with an idea that they come with a fee to use them, then drivers will accept that. If people have five years of free autonomous vehicles, and then all of a sudden you're then going to try and put a congestion price, then it's going to be politically impossible. That's a very interesting point. We, we've, we've tried to introduce congestion pricing for a while. It had very strong political opposition. And at the end, we've introduced them not as the, as the cost, but as a reduction of your annual fee for registration of your car. So you basically have this, you pay the fee, and then at the end of the year, you get a rebate of how much you've, you've, you have not used through the congestion. So that's a, that's a big pilot right now. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to add is that on top of people willing to sit in the traffic, there are all new populations of people that 
today cannot drive. For example, our children cannot drive. The elderly sometimes cannot drive. So now with autonomous vehicles, they all can now get, get into a vehicle. So there will be just bigger populations that would be, uh, would be willing to, to or interested in, in using this. So that would go into the same effect. You know, you, Absolutely. You Create, but yeah. creating consumer value, I mean, it creates plenty of consumer value absolutely. to enable the elderly to go around, absolutely. but it does create congestion. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. So you, you, what I'm saying is that your, your, your point about congestion pricing is even more, more, more strongly needed. So, you, you know, you, you have written a paper called uh, Urbanization is Discontents. You, you've mentioned some of them. And it brings me to, uh, to, to some of those issues in uh, 2011 we had basically a, a huge mass protest by young people in Tel Aviv and other cities, but mostly in Tel Aviv, which basically occupied the streets of the city with tents and were protesting basically everything, but mainly the cost of, uh, cost of housing, because they cannot live in, in the city that they want to, to live in. And so this is definitely came close, close to home. Uh, so I would like to, maybe you can expand on some of those ills that sort of befall in the cities in the last decade or two uh, that sort of came in some sense from over success of the cities as attractors of of sort of more and more demand can you can you it's, elaborate on that absolutely it's always the way right i mean the 19th century uh cities grew and it took 50 years for city governments to catch up to their growth and build the sewers and clean water that cities needed Similarly, uh, you know, cities didn't have an affordability problem in the 1970s when they looked like they were headed for the trash heap of history. But 40 years of success have uh, you know, collided against a limited supply of housing and created a massive affordability crisis. So the impact of increased demand for cities, not just as places of productivity, but also as places of pleasure, means that people want to live in them. Uh, normal population growth uh, accentuates that. Uh, and yet cities have made it very, very difficult to build um, in a way that was not true historically. I mean, if you look in the 1920s, the early 1920s, New York City was building 100,000 new housing units every year. I mean, that's a spectacular amount of growth relative to today. Um, and the change partially has become uh, from understandable reticence to allow change. People get anxious when their neighborhoods get changed. People get nostalgic for the old city. Uh, and an increased willingness to regulate ourselves out of new supply. But there's no free lunch here. If you make it difficult to build in a place that's attractive, you're going to mean that poorer people, middle income people, younger people can't afford to live in the city. And that affordability crisis is self-imposed. It's created by those limitations on supply. And there's no real way around it other than allowing more building. There's no way to fix the affordability problem by just allocating a few units for uh, uh, for supposedly, you know, uh, worthy recipients or um, even even more uh, problematically to subsidize new buying, uh, to subsidize renting, which in a world of fixed supply, if you put in a housing subsidy, it just pushes the price up higher. So that ends up being just a subsidy to existing owners, not a long run search for not a long run solution for affordability. So. The, the one of the biggest urban ills is indeed this affordability crisis, which creates you know the protests that you mentioned, the arguments over gentrification, uh, which became ubiquitous. We will get a little bit of a respite of this thanks to the pandemic, but this has to be one of the most important jobs of cities throughout the world is to figure out where they can add density, where they can permit large amounts of, of housing in places that people want to live. And I think what you're saying in the case of Israel is that we really need to focus on delivering housing, delivering space in the areas of Israel that are the most vibrant, that are most attractive, and where there's the most demand. Um, there are other areas of, of trauma. So in the U.S., the work of my colleagues Raj Chetty and Nathan Hendren really have emphasized the extent to which there is an opportunity gap between cities and suburbs, and even with rural areas. So whereas cities are great places to be a working adult, they're great places of productivity for uh, people in their 20s or 30s, uh, the data seems to suggest, at least for the generation that was born around 1980, that growing up in a city was pretty disastrous. Now, I found this kind of surprising because I grew up in a city myself and I kind of think I turned out okay. Uh, but in terms of, of the adult incomes, they're just a lot lower if you grew up in a dense part of a metropolitan area or if you went to, lived in an area which was within the central city school district. Um, if I think about the sort of largest and most important failing of city governments, it is this, you know, 
inability to provide upward mobility for urban residents. You know, every city has inequality. Plato wrote that, you know, every city of whatever size is in reality two cities, one a city of the rich, the other a city of the poor. This has been going on for 2,400 years, and cities should never apologize for their inequality. Cities attract poor people because cities are fun places to spend money and be rich, and they attract, they attract poor people as well. Uh, sorry, cities attract rich people because they're relatively fun places to spend money and to be rich, but they also attract poor people because they're better places to be poor. They have a better social safety net. You can get around using public transportation. You can find economic opportunity. But the corollary of that is that cities can only accept their inequality if they're also being escalators for upward mobility. And the Chetty Hendren data suggests that too often they're failing in that. And that's really uh, an absolutely central task. Policing. So it is a triumph of cities that cities became much safer between the 1980s and the 2000s, right? Many of the things that we love about urban spaces, the ability to enjoy a stroll after going to a restaurant, the ability to use urban parks, these are only possible, these pleasures are only possible because the cities became safe. But of course, that safety was achieved in part through mass incarceration of young Americans, many of them African-American. Um, that is a huge human cost and one that we should never be willing to pay uh, and we have to figure out ways that we can provide both safety and do so in a way that doesn't lock up vast numbers of people or treat them disrespectfully by the police. And so this is a challenge that uh, protesters have correctly focused on. But we have to remember that there isn't an easy answer of just eliminating the police, right? It's also a basic human right to be able to walk home, you know, for a little girl to be able to walk home from school safely without looking over her shoulder in fear. And that girl will not be safe if there is not a law enforcement agency to take responsibility for keeping those city streets safe. So that is an added challenge uh, that cities are, are facing that has been particularly focused on right now. Yeah, that is, uh, there are no easy, no easy answers in those, uh, unfortunately. It's, um, so if we, if we try to sort of summarize your outlook, I started with a very pessimistic scenario. So if, what is your overall outlook starting, let's say 2022 on? Uh, on uh, cities large and small? Are they beyond their peak or will we observe the continuous growth and magnetic appeal of the large cities? They will remain as centers of innovation. Are you optimistic? So it all depends on the time frame, and it all depends on how universal. So the next three to five years, it's going to be tough years. No question. I mean, the economy is, is you know, in difficult shape. The, the small business ecosystem is in difficult shape. Cities' fiscal situations are in difficult set, shape. Uh, the ability to figure out how public transit will work is, is, non, is, is not so easy. Um, and there are, continue to be cities, particularly America's Rust Belt cities, that really have never recovered from the 1970s, and they are still facing challenges. But if you ask me about 10 years, 15 years down the line, down the line I continue to be deeply optimistic about the value of face-to-face -face contact, the value of cities, and the ability of cities to reinvent themselves again and again. We are at our heart an urban species. Our greatest gifts are our ability to collaborate with other human beings. Our, uh, our, the best way we know to deal with the, the onrush of new information on the, uh, for the need to create new forms of, of creativity are by connecting to other humans, right? Uh, Face-to-face -face contact is deep in our DNA, and cities enable that. And, you know, cities have been creating miraculous new innovations, miraculous meetings uh, for millennia, and the age of urban miracles is not over. And so I am at my heart deeply optimistic about the cities to reinvent themselves, with the caveat that the next few years are not going to be easy. So this is, we're going to call it the age of uh, new urban miracles, uh so I'm, I'm being told uh, that we have a few questions from the, from the audience. Uh, one, one question is, uh, how would you predict the future of the financial, uh, financial centers? So let's say, for, for example, New York and London. Uh, they, they rely on, on this specific industry, which is actually, given today's technology, is highly movable. So uh, what, do you, what do you expect on, on the future of these specific two cities? So 20 years ago, um, we all noticed that New York came back on the you know, economic muscle of the financial services industry. At its height, about 40% of the payroll in the island of Manhattan was being paid to financial services, right? So this was a huge economic engine. 
Its focus on the island of Manhattan was because it was the industry that valued information most highly. Right? There's no industry in which you can become a millionaire, even a billionaire, you know, more quickly by knowing a bit more than finance. Right? And so the information advantages of face-to-face proximity were, were you know, well worth paying for. And you see this at a small level in the spatial congregation of a trading floor, right? Here we have some of the wealthiest people on the planet who in normal industries would sit behind large desks, enjoying all the privacy that their prosperity has made possible. Here they are in finance and they're on top of each other. And so there is really value to face-to-face contact. Now, depending upon which part of finance you're talking about, the industry has become less associated with this sort of tacit face-to-face knowledge and more associated with things that are electronic, things that are quantitative. That still involves some face-to-face connection. So I I think, you know, it's not like urban financial centers are dead and there are different pockets within finance. But I think the basic thrust of your your suggestion that at least there will be a significant amount of financial services that continues to decentralize, that feels right to me. Um, So I think that there, you know, at least in some parts of finance, the continued move to lower density centers is likely to continue. Um, But there will continue to be at least some parts of finance, those parts of finance that are most, you know, focused on on human knowledge uh, that will remain in cities. I see. Thank you. Uh, Another question that I've uh, just been given is um, many in our audience are are startups, and both Israeli and and, and from around the world, and uh, they are uh, looking at this as an opportunity. So you've mentioned a whole bunch of challenges. Uh, for example, you've mentioned education system, you've mentioned uh, policing without harassment, without, you know, there, without the negative externalities. W- what would you think, which areas do you think you can use sort of much more data, m- uh, more uh, rapid analytics, sort of AI, uh, sensors, all, all kinds of things to, to help cities manage their problems and and address them so those that can be opportunities for those startups great so um certainly cities need help around public transportation so um my my friends at salesforce have been trying to help the city of boston uh to use visual imagery to measure the the crowding of buses uh, and to provide real-time information for how you know low density the buses are to make customers more comfortable uh, using their space. I think that's the, the demand for apps for consumers uh, to actually learn how crowded the buses are and even you know uh, how frequently people are using masks. Uh, that's certainly in the in the short run. That's something that's that's there. Um, any apps in the short run that help people gauge disease uh, risk are going to be valuable as long as this pandemic rages. Um, uh, there is some issue about how to monetize that, uh, but I assume that advertising will be the natural thing. Um, schooling it remains a big deal. So uh, 20 years ago, there was a lot of hope that the various forms of electronic uh, education were somehow or other going to eliminate the need for all this face-to-face teaching that we're seeing. Uh, and yet, if we're you know seeing anything in the world of of you know zooming our way towards schooling, it's that much of this electronic education is falling short, uh, especially for less advantaged kids. Um, and so the the world of electronic schooling really has to figure out how to get into the most difficult households, uh, the most challenged households, the most disadvantaged households, and to actually provide something that will actually help close the opportunity gap, right? And that means randomized controlled trials. That means things that actually are, you know, not just a a cool app that looks fun that you and your tech buddies think would be a neat thing to learn from. This actually means something that you actually test out using significant samples of high poverty kids and that it actually has a meaningful impact on things that, you know, the children, their parents, their educators actually care about. So this this remains uh, really a deeply unsolved problem. Um, around policing, um, I think that, the, that, that, you know, we're almost assuredly working in the right direction. It's hard for me to imagine a world in which we won't go to sort of universal body cameras, uh, for comps going forward. Uh, that means technology. Um, and, you know, there'll be more things that wrap around that. So we really want to move to a world in which, uh, there's, there's, you know, much more tight monitoring of police and the, you know, routine politeness and courtesy 
become as much of a policeman's armor as you know safety and uh, protection for their own own uh, body. So um, you know I think we can get there, but technology will be part of the solution. So cities have these these difficulties, and technology can be part of the solution. I think also you know the startup nation is part of the solution in that they will think about how to reinvent urban space. And I would not be, uh, you know, I, I would be guilty of gross hubris if I thought that I could imagine all the amazing things that the creative entrepreneurs who are, you know, uh, hopefully listening to this podcast will come up to make our urban spaces as fun and as exciting as they could, as they can be. Thank you. Um, the, the, the last question that I, that I wanted to ask, that, that the audience will, uh, wanted to ask, uh, is uh, you've mentioned before that there will be substitution, you know, scrappier businesses will replace bigger businesses, etc. Do you envision sort of a, a stratification of the population in the cities where people, younger people would want to congregate in cities and older people would want to congregate in cities in, in, for different reasons, of course, but the, the sort of people with families will sort of move out. Will that, will, can that sort of change the 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 city um, fabric and and the and the dynamics and will necessitate all kinds of amenities and infrastructure for aging on the one hand and 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 the young on the other sort of interesting combination. So so we we have been moving in that direction in part in the U.S. because of the failure of urban schools. So um, there had been a hollowing out of the center of cities, both in terms of the income distribution and in terms of the age distribution, for many decades. Uh, it's not something that I'm very fond of, um, uh, but it is it is a reality, and it does create interesting conflicts between the amenities that are are desired by the old and the amenities that are desired by the young. And of course, one of those conflicts is around new construction, where the old, who are often owners, have very little appetite for neighborhood change. The young, who are typically renters and are more open to seeing their neighborhoods change, are, are presumably much more open to it. Um, I would expect that the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, again, uh, it depends on how quickly the pandemic risk continues, uh, will have a, a it, it will push towards younger businesses, will push towards younger residents. Um, many of the sort of empty nesters uh, are the ones who are most vulnerable to the disease. Uh, and many of them you know, have chosen you know, to, to get out of town during the current pandemic or uh, to, to you know, stay in, in, and not relocate to the city. Um, so I would have expected younger businesses, younger younger residents in the in the medium term, at least in cities, um, and for sure that will create political pressures to change the mix of amenities. That will create economic pressures, whereas businesses will be more focused on again providing the things that the young want, um, which probably is in in this realm of experiences uh, that will be sold on on urban storefronts throughout uh, the world. So. Um, I think there's no question, that at least in the short run, there will be demographic pushes from this. But there's a lot to like in a younger, scrappier city. There's a lot to like in a city that has fewer long-established large businesses and has more new startups that will help the business, help the city to rethink its future. And my just my big hope is that governments react to that and understand that they need a regulatory apparatus that is kind to the young that enables the kind of building and new construction that provides the units that the young need and is kind to new businesses and that understands that we really need to make it as seamless as possible for new startups to open and to bring life to cities that have been hit hard by COVID-19. Well, th thank you. It's actually been happening in Tel Aviv in the last um, five, 10 years where the bigger businesses, actual financial industries moving out to satellite cities and the cities being filled with startups. Right, right around us, there are thousands of them. So this is this is an interesting perspective. And thank you so much for for sharing your insights with us and sharing your optimism with us. It's it's actually a good thing that that we don't have to uh, mourn the cities yet. Um, we very much appreciate your 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 coming virtually to Tel Aviv, and we look forward to to having you over many more times. Uh, Wendy, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Eugene. Rita, that was some kickoff. Thank you, Wendy. I think it was a, a really thought-provoking session, and I especially was intrigued and uh, encouraged by what Ed Glazer had to say about 
his deep-seated optimism uh, concerning the ability of cities to reinvent themselves. Definitely. I've got to believe that there are municipal leaders and uh, urban experts around the world that know they need to tap into innovation in order to stay ahead. Share with us what Startup Nation Central is doing in that space. Uh, of course, that's a great question. Thank you, Wendy, very much. So we are a nonprofit for uh, matching technology to a need. What that means is we connect relevant technological solutions to those challenges that global leaders are facing. We have a menu uh, of uh, different offerings uh, mm -hmm. on what Israel has to what Israel has to offer. Uh, for instance, going back to Professor Glazer's point about smart transportation and autonomous uh, vehicles, Israel happened to be particularly uh, strong in the mobility sector, and mm -hmm. SNC as uh, Third Nation Central, we can be an address uh, for following on trends and innovations in the smart city sector. Uh, one of those startups is on our platform uh, that provides smart city solution. It's uh, Zen City. Mm -hmm. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, we invited a, a Yal Fetter Levy to share with us today what Zen City has to offer to municipal leaders from around the world. So I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, definitely. I think local governments are really at the front lines of this pandemic. They're in charge of shaping social distancing policies, of supporting the local businesses in their community, of really reaching out to the most vulnerable members of uh, the, the, the population that they serve. And in order to do all that in a meaningful way, they really have to listen to the voice of the community that they serve. And that is exactly what Zen City does. Across over 150 cities from Eilat here in Israel, all the way to LA in California, we help local governments understand the needs and priorities of the communities that they serve by looking at conversations that are happening online and analyzing them with advanced AI. During this pandemic, we've seen so many local government organizations reach out to us and ask for our help in supporting their important work as they serve their communities on those front lines that I mentioned before. We couldn't be more proud of being able to support all of them from right here in Israel, and uh, we hope that local governments around the world keep serving their communities in a meaningful way as we adjust to this new normal. Thank you, Eyal. That's actually a great example and connecting to the session of Professor Jim Kandel and Ed, uh, Professor Ed Glazer. Um, another real uh, challenge that cities are facing uh, these days is how to keep track on number of people in a given space at a given time. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I, I think that uh, Ed Glazer actually referred to that phenomenon of yeah. people still want to meet face to face. He, he had a great line, uh, face to face contact is deep in our DNA. Definitely. Uh, so we actually invited another startup from the Finder platform uh, to talk about just that. Uh, it's called uh, Point Grab, and we have the CEO, Daron Shachar, here with us. Thanks, Wendy. Much appreciated. Point Grab was established over a decade ago, but our technology that is installed in hundreds of places around the globe is even more useful now in post-COVID as big organizations are getting back to the new normal. We provide a sensor that can provide organizations the location and count of people within any given space. Usually it's their offices. And post-COVID, we see more and more organizations trying to get information real-time information about social distancing, about the distance between their employees or guests, about the count of people in any meeting room, floor, or even building. We can provide all of that and much more with this single device that is IoT device. I think that's a great, great revolution for big organizations who are trying to really meet with the new normal regulations that are changing almost on a daily basis. It's an opportunity also for me to thank SNC for this very, very inspirational conference. And I hope this ecosystem is going to grow and be very, very successful. Thank you very much. Tyrone, thanks for joining us. Now, as you recall, uh, we put a question in front of you at the start of this session, um, just to trigger it for you. It's, will the major cities remain strong innovation hubs? Now, here's a, a glance at your responses. 70% of you answered, yes, but additional second tier cities will grow in importance. 25% of you answered, 
yes, superstar cities, New York, think Seattle, think Tel Aviv, will maintain their status. And only 5% of you answered that even superstar cities will lose their dominance. I have to say, if there's a headline here, I think that that's 70% uh, that the superstar cities will maintain uh, their dominance, but that second tier cities are going to rise. We're actually seeing that when we look at the strength of different ecosystems in cities around the world. In fact, um, a number of the uh, indexes that came out in the last couple of months that rank cities for the strength of their tech ecosystem are illustrating exactly that point. We're starting to hear about places like uh, Oxford uh, in the UK as a second tier city to London, uh, Waterloo, Ontario, second tier city to Toronto, and, and of course Jerusalem is, is definitely considered one of those rising tech ecosystems in the world. Um, now to a very interesting and unique uh, aspect of this conference. Uh, we would have liked to invite the 6,500 Israeli startups and innovative companies to meet with you and to showcase their technologies. However, uh, pandemic constraints, what we have been able to do is create an online startup expo where we've invited 55 startups that cover technology across multiple sectors, smart cities, cybersecurity, agritech, and of course, many, many technologies directly related to COVID. Now, I know that if you were at a, at a live conference, you would be walking into an enormous exhibit hall and you would be standing in line to talk to the different entrepreneurs at such an expo. So we've made this very simple. All you need to do on the conference platform is go to the tab that says Startup Expo. And when you go in there, you will be face to face, as it were, with our 55 startups and very easily able to set up any B2B meetings that are, that are relevant for you. Uh, I wanna thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're going to see you at 6 p.m. Israel time for the next session, uh, which is Pandemic Tech, How Tech is Our Best Hope for fighting the next pandemic. We'll see you then.